today I'm going to talk about my discoveries with nonconformity. I think uh, sort of it's it's huge pressure to be ending such an amazing conference and sort of being towards uh, the end of such amazing, amazing speakers who've spent their lives and I'm barely just starting out. So I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just sort of go over what I know uh, from where I've been and the things I've done. And you might not completely agree with them. I might be changing them um, very often as I grow up also. But uh, hopefully it will be somewhat similar, somewhat different to what we've already heard today. So my first discovery with nonconformity, I think, is Nonconformity is a natural human tendency. No one tells you to be a nonconformist. No one tells you to do things differently. It's things that from the very time that we wake up and till the time that we go to sleep, we do every second of every hour of every day. With the way you dress, the way you look at things, the way you want other people to perceive you, the way you think, the way you talk, you're always, at all times, trying to do things differently or trying to do different things altogether. So literally, unless you go back and someone tells you, oh wait, you're kind of a nonconformist, like I think it's a reminder that this, this conference just gave to me, you never really know that you're doing things differently unless someone tells you that. So I'm going to share a bit of a personal story um, today. Two days ago, my grandmother passed away. And one of the most amazing stories that my dad has always sort of told me about her is that she was all of 22 years of age in 1947. Uh, she was living with my grandfather and his extended family in Lailpur, in Pakistan, and in modern day Pakistan. And throughout that entire independence time, throughout all of those massacres, she saw that struggle and she was literally a part of it. She was literally, I wouldn't say a victim because she, she came out alive, but she carried my three month old, uh, my three month old aunt, now my aunt, she was three months old then, and three of her other brother's children, one was age five, one was age nine, one was age 12, and carried them alone, being all of 22, across the border, in trains that we, at that time, as, as I, I'm sure everyone knows here, we did not know that those trains are going to reach India or not. And once she did, her and my grandfather literally built a new life all together in Delhi and literally saw the rise of a nation. It's, it's, I mean, just even seeing this gives me goosebumps. So my grandmother went to school till class four. Never in her life did someone ask for her voice. Never in her life did someone come to her and say, wait, you might be doing things differently. You might be impacting a large family of people. You might be the only one responsible for all of your kids and your other relatives' kids and how they are and how they've grown up and the fact that they all have a place in their world. So, I mean, two days ago, we had all of the family together and we cremated her and everyone was just talking about instances from her life. And I couldn't sort of stop wondering about this. When was the last time I sat with her and, and, I, and I just said, thank you for being the way you were. Thank you for probably being the most inspiring person that I know who went to school to class four. So my second discovery with nonconformity comes from there. Education has nothing to do with it. And now I'm going to come to my story. I started the Becoming I Foundation when I was 19, uh, about four years ago. And when someone now asks me, you know, what is your education? What is your background? I don't say Delhi University economics honors. 
I say becoming a foundation. I have not known anything better. I have not done anything better. And I don't think at any point in my life I will be able to attribute as much knowledge, as much experience, as much feeling, as much passion for something other than the Becoming I Foundation. What we do is that we get young people connected with community development. We get young people to come together, come up with ideas to old problems and to new problems, and come up with a solution for the same. We get young people involved in education. We get young in people involved in women empowerment. We get young people involved in sex trafficking. And we tell them that, listen, these are the solutions that have been coming on from years. People have been talking about education since we can remember. But not much has changed. So there's something wrong there. And that's where we come in. Project Leap today is challenging and disrupting how the Indian education system works. It is challenging how in each and every classroom, just by putting dance, music, theater, art and craft and sports, you can change the way a child perceives his education to be. Project Enable today is challenging the right to education as, and how private schools around the country are, is perceiving it. We're saying that no matter where you come from, no matter how much oil you have in your hair, no matter what brand of oil that is, no matter what your uniform looks like, no matter whether you have a fancy tiffin box in your bag or not, you have the right to be in the same school as someone coming from a better background, a so-called better background than you do. And we're not just stating it like the government has, we're actually making it happen. Project FISA today is challenging how the world looks at sex trafficking. We're saying, don't make laws, don't edit those laws, don't sit and judge what these women do. Try and put yourself in that perspective and think of this one very, very basic thing, which is probably the first thing I learned in economics. If you give them a better option, if you give them a more respectful option that gives them as much or more money, they will do it. And that's something that, it's, it's really funny how it just hasn't reached the kind of brains that we want it to. So basically saying that education has nothing to do with it. Because working in the education sector and going back to the kind of schools that we've been to, the kind of sort of colleges that all of us are very, very proud of, I'm sorry, but as I see it, the education system has failed miserably. And it hasn't failed us, we have failed it. Because it doesn't teach us the three most important things that any kind of innovator, that any kind of entrepreneur, that any kind of well-deserving person with a brain needs to know. Inspiration, passion, and purpose. With all of our textbooks, with all of our research, with everything coming from around the world, our education system has failed because it has not taught us those basic things of education. But then the question comes, why do we need that to live? Why do we need that to get a job? Why do we need those three things in whatever we're doing? It's fairly simple. Again, going back to the basics. Every day, this country, whether it's, it's in, in the economy, it's in the politics, it's in the education itself, every day this country is facing new problems. Unique problems that we haven't faced before. And alongside, we already have a gamut of huge number of problems that we yet haven't solved. And the answer to all of those, problem, to all of those problems lies in one simple thing. Creative problem solving coming up with a solution in the most creative way possible, doing things that have not been done before, having that dare in you to be able to come up with those new ideas. And creative, a creative problem solver is very simply an innovator. I'm talking about innovation, something that I think in business schools, in, in um, postgraduate education centers, everywhere, innovation is something that has been introduced, but something that as Indians, we're extremely, extremely lagging in, and we're not able to accept. So now I'm going to come to my third point, and my third discovery with sort of nonconformity. And for that, I'd like everyone to get up, please. Everyone to stand up. All right. I would want 
on this side the last five rows to sit down. On this side, the last five rows. Right now, the people standing are the ones who will ever see the face of a school in this country. Now, I would want this entire block to sit down. And I would want the back half of this block to sit down. The people currently standing will ever reach high school in this country. Can I have this entire block sit down, please? Can I have the last three rows of the remaining people standing here to sit down? The people currently standing are the ones who will ever graduate from high school in this country. Can I have the last, the remaining two rows to sit down. Can I also have the second row to sit down? These people will probably, if all goes well, if the system believes in them, if their parents believe in them, if, if organizations like ours believe in them, they will probably go to college. Can I have you sit down, please? So this, come, this brings me to my third and probably my most important discovery with education and with nonconformity. Education has everything to do with it, but it doesn't. The picture that you just saw, it, the first time this was done to me in, in a gathering like this, it, it literally scared me out of my mind. I was hope, like all of the hope was drained out of me. Everything that I wanted to do was just out of the window and for that day I was just like, this is not going to happen. This country is too messed up. But I'm gonna turn that around for you and I'm gonna say that this is not a dismal picture. I'm gonna say that there is a way to make this picture better. And I'm gonna tell you a story at this point. Um, this was sometime uh, last year. We had uh, Dr. Vinod Raina come to one of our summits. Dr. Vinod Raina is the person who wrote the right to education. Uh, he sadly passed away a few months ago. Um, and one of the things that he said in his speech that stuck with me till now is the story of this little boy that he was interacting with in one of the villages that he went to visit. And I mean, this boy, it's, it's not a formal school, it's just sort of an unorganized setup under a tree where a couple of teachers are teaching children from the village. And the, the uh, topic of discussion is whether a seed is living or non-living. And, you know, everyone was just, what is this about? Ye master ji kya pooch rahe hai? Gehun ke bare mein pooch rahe hai? And everyone is very confused. So this little boy very confidently stands up and says, it's living, sir. And so the uh, professor asks him, how, do you, how can you say that? How do you know? And he says that, you know, when I go back home, my father is a farmer, and we have these bories of um, wheat, and which is full of seeds. And every time as humans, when we exhale, if you feel your breath, it's warm. So every time I put my hand in those bodies, it's warm. Which means the seed is breathing. Which means it's living. So I think what we need to take out from this is that, yes, the education system has failed us. But there is still innovation happening on the ground. Yes, we haven't given as much time and as much resources to this entire sector, sector and there are lots of people that have been sort of shunned out completely. But they are finding their own methods and their own ways of coming up. They're finding their own ways of thinking, of coming up with new ideas without a formal education to be able to come up at par. And what's really, really amazing here is that just imagine for a second if you're able to take this raw talent we're able to take this raw thinking and then 
add an organized education sector or an organized education set setup or a basic school which then teaches innovation, which teaches inspiration, which teaches purpose, which teaches passion. You add that to this raw talent, there's no way this country is not reaching where we want it to. And I think that's something that has fascinated me for a very long time. So everything that I've done with my organization, everything in the education sector, there's a project that I'm about to take up um, in the next few months, which is that I want to go around the country and I want to find these innovators. I want to go to the grassroots and I want to look for these individuals who have put that innovation in education, who are taking those initiatives of creating those kind of organized or unorganized setups where children are going back home inspired. Children are going back home with some form of learning that our current education system doesn't give them. So that's the plan where um, I want to basically just go out there and study the most innovative teaching practices and hopefully have enough collaborations and come up with the most powerful teaching methods or the most powerful teaching tools with the help of a lot of educators and have those implemented in our schools today. So in the end, I'm just going to recite this one, um, this one quotation that, that my dad, um, this one writing by Iqbal that my dad has been saying to me ever since I was a kid. Khudi kukar bulan ditna ki har tadbir se pehle khuda tut se khud puche ki bata teri raza kya hai. And loosely translated, it means elevate yourself to such a level that before issuing any decree of destiny, God himself asks you, what do you intend to do? So all I'm going to say is that I intend to inspire people. I tend to create innovative leaders. I intend to be the most innovative as is possible for me. I intend to make this country the country that my grandmother fought for. I would intend to make this country the reason why she came from Pakistan here for. And if towards the end of that, I'm able to impact, if I'm able to touch as many, even half as many lives as she did, I would have done myself, her, and the world justice. Thank you.